Hello friend, thanks for joining me. You know, one of my favorite things to do at the end of the year is to take a pause, take a look at what I've read over the course of the year. My reading is actually pretty structured, but you know, at the end of the year, I like to see sort of how it all worked out because when I structure my reading, it's really, it's really planned around interests more so than any other framework. So I just like to take a look at it from different angles at the end of the year to see what it all ended up looking like. So for this year, I wound up reading 45 books. I had actually planned to read 45 books, so I hit this right on target, which I was pretty happy about. I would have liked to have gotten a few more in this year, but 45 is a pretty good goal for me when fitting in everything else I have going on in my life. So 45 books here, uh, it's across all genres. This list here is the order that they were read in. So you can tell if you're just taking a quick look that I read uh, all different kinds of books. I read fiction, different kinds of fiction, as well as mixed in with nonfiction. And there's really no rhyme or reason to, I may jump from one, one sort of type of book to something completely, it's more or less opposite with the next read. That's just sort of how I roll. But what we'll do is we'll break this, this, this list of 45 down and by fiction and nonfiction, so you can take a look at it that way. And then we'll just break it down into some subgroups, the way that I've sort of grouped the books. So we'll take a look at it in several different ways. So just to kick it off with, with fiction, so I ended up reading 33 works of fiction. This is a little more than usual for me. Uh, I usually read about equal fiction and nonfiction. This year was weighted a bit more on, on the side of fiction, and I'm not sure why that is. It's just the way it worked out this year. And yeah, they're, they're sort of all over the place. Here they're listed chronologically by publication date, something I like to take a look at, and we'll look at in more detail here uh, later. So this, is, this is list is by publication year rather than by order read. But these 33 works of fiction. And then I read 12 works of nonfiction. Nonfiction, I read, you know, different books. This first book listed here, The Anatomy of Melancholy, is actually a textbook, and other kinds of things philosophy, essay collections, uh, some film histories, different things I read this year. And we're going to talk about those in more detail here in a bit. These are also listed by publication year rather than in the order read. So let's jump into it in the grouping. So the first group that I want to talk about is literary fiction because this is one of the most uh, 11 books read in, in what I'm calling literary fiction. Now, not all these works of fiction everyone would call literary. I'm classifying this very generally for my purpose, and so it's not meant to be any kind of scholarly or literary criticism sort of real uh, classification. I'm classifying these as literary fiction. For example, The Orient Express, not everybody would say that was literary fiction. However, I'm classifying it that way. So these 11 books, you know, Orient Express by Graham Greene, it was the first book by Graham Greene that I've ever read, and I decided my, a friend of mine gifted me this book, so that's how it wound up getting read this year, and I enjoyed this a lot. You know, it was a group traveling across a sort of a train across Europe, uh, a lot of fun. Then I read Malacroix by Henri Bosco. This had been recommended by a, a viewer, and I enjoyed that a lot, sort of a mythological tale. The Great Man Theory by Teddy Wayne, one of my favorite living authors, contemporary author. He had a new book out in 2022, so I got that read, loved it. And The Wind-Up Bird Chronicle by Haruki Murakami. I've been reading through Murakami's works for a while now, so I decided to give that one a go. Loved it, of course. Sense of Sensibility by Jane Austen. I love Jane Austen, and I've been rereading her, her books and chatting them here on my channel because I had read them last before I had a channel, so uh, happy to get Sense and Sensibility Read, always an enjoyable experience for me. And then I tried The Vicar of Wakefield by Oliver Goldsmith uh, from 1766. This is another sort of village drama, uh, quite a bit different in tone than a, than a Jane Austen book, but nevertheless, uh, this picturesque sort of village life in England. I enjoyed it. Then I read Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. Uh, you know, I've been reading through his works as well, and they never disappoint. You know, I read All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr. I had read uh, Cloud Cuckoo Land last year and loved it. So uh, enjoyed All the Light We Cannot See this year. 
Uh, a Room with a View by E.M. Forster is, uh, I had read before, but I decided to give this a reread, uh, sort of from the turn of like 1908, Edwardian kind of uh, young woman, sort of coming of age, uh, or really getting to know herself a little bit uh, in this book. It was uh, kind of a, a love story combined with travel and just a lot of fun. Then I read The Book of Form and Emptiness by Ruth Ozeki. And this was the first book by Ruth Ozeki that I had read. I'd had this on my reading list for a couple of years, and I just loved this. This was so good. Then I uh, read Cakes and Ale by W. Somerset Mom. I've been reading through Mom's works as well. So this year, um, I decided to give Cakes and Ale a try, and I loved it. Um, you know, the next grouping that I'll talk about is, uh, I'm calling it Philosophy Spiritual. These are some works of, are works of philosophy. Others are more like theological or just works on consciousness of the brain, things like that. So Panpsychism in the, Panpsychism in the West by David Skirbina. I had it's a survey of the philosophy of Panpsychism, and I really got a lot from this book. And then I decided to read The Anatomy of Melancholy by Robert Burton. This is from the 17th century. It's actually a medical textbook, and it, but it reads like a, I don't know, it reads like a philosophy. Um, I just, I loved it too. It's a significant read though, significant time uh, commitment there, but it was well worth it for me. Then I read The Abolition of Man by C.S. Lewis. This was the first C.S. Lewis, one of first of two books I read of C.S. Lewis this year, another one coming up. Then I read Saving the Appearances, A Study in Idolatry by Owen Barfield. The idolatry that's being talked about here is not what you think. This was a work of philosophy. It took a bit of, to, of work for me to get through this book, but it was worth it. I enjoyed it a lot. It's of course sort of a look at the evolution of human consciousness and uh, so to me, that's really interesting sort of phase that I've been going through over the last year or so. I uh, read A Treasury of Albert Schweitzer, which were just excerpts of his writings. And then I read Dante's Divine Comedy, A Guide for the Spiritual Journey, as well as The Divine Comedy. I read these as a pair. So I read The Divine Comedy itself by Dante. And then I read this commentary by Mark Vernon, uh, Dante's Divine Comedy, A Guide for the Spiritual Journey. And reading these two together was really enriching. So I, if you're going to read The Divine Comedy, I definitely recommend that you find some sort of guide like this or some sort of companion to, uh, to guide you through it because there's a lot of historical references in the Divine Comedy that, that had meaning for the people of the time, but we're talking about the 14th century, so unless you have someone explaining it to you in a commentary, I think it would be a little hard to get through uh, unless you're just an expert on the 14th century, 14th century Italy. Anyway, I read The Prophet by Khalil Gibran, and that is kind of this poetry of a prophet departing wisdom to a local a town before he departs and it's really beautiful i really i had heard about this for a long time and i had not for some reason just put off reading it and it is really really good then i read this essays two essays the usefulness of useful knowledge by abraham flexer flexner this is a really comp very um well-known essay about you know knowledge for knowledge's sake and how uh, knowledge doesn't have to be practical in order to be useful. And I thought that was cool. Then I read this series of essays called The Nature of Consciousness by Rupert Spira. This is about essays about consciousness and what it, what it means, uh, mind and matter, com sort of unity and consciousness. And I thought they were really interesting as well. And then I read another collection of essays called The Game of All Games by J.P. Pereira. So I read uh, another collection of essays by this author a couple of years ago and loved it. And so he has this new uh, essay collection out, The Game of All Games, um, about these topics of really about how to live a good life. And I, you know, that's the topic that I, that I really love. So I enjoyed that a lot. Okay, so I had 11 works of spirit, philosophy, spiritual, 11 works of literary, uh, what I'm calling literary fiction. And then so my next most read area was fantasy, where I read seven books in fantasy. I read four books of the Wheel of Time series by Robert Jordan, A Crown of Swords, 
The Path of Daggers, Winter's Heart, and Crossroads of Twilight. So I've been buddy reading this series with a coworker, Anna, over the last two years. So we should finish out this series, all 14 books. We should finish that this series out in 20. But I have a good time. You know, I enjoy this series. Then I read another uh, fantasy called The Greater Trumps by Charles Williams. This is sort of Christian fantasy. It's got a theological kind of message. And I, this is, I uh, can't remember how many, I've read at least two or three of his other books and chatted them here on my channel. Um, then I read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. So I mentioned earlier I had read The Abolition of Man by C.S. Lewis, so I decided to also read this work of theological fantasy by C.S. Lewis. And, you know, I loved it. I knew the story already from the movie adaptation. I just had never read the actual book, so I enjoyed that. Then I read A Game of Thrones by George R.R. R. Martin. You know, I don't know if you could consider yourself having being well-read in fantasy if you haven't read uh, A Game of Thrones. I had not, and I decided to give it a try. It is really well done, really just extraordinary world-building. It's a little grim and a little intense at times, more than a little, <laughs> uh, but it was an exciting read, and I did enjoy it. So, yeah, seven books in fantasy. Then I read five books in science fiction, and uh, two of those were found, found two foundation novels by Isaac Asimov. I read Foundation's Edge and Foundation and Earth by Isaac Asimov, sort of finishing out that series except for the prequels, which I have on my list for next year. Uh, but then I also read two books in the Culture series by Ian M. Banks, I read Consider Phlebas and The Player of Games. And then I read another work of science fiction called Blindsight by Peter Watts, which was all about how it's almost would be impossible probably to understand an alien intelligence or an alien consciousness that would be so different from our own. So five works in science fiction, seven in fantasy. Then I also read five works in, in what I'm calling historical fiction. This first one listed here, Circe by Madeline Miller. Circe might not be historical fiction because it's really a retelling of a of Greek myth, and so they might not have been real people. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm classifying it as a historical fiction because it felt like that to me. And then Ivanhoe by Sir Walter Scott. So this is a very famous, you know, early uh, work of historical fiction set in the uh, sort of the Middle Ages. And Ivanhoe is, of course, a, a very honorable chivalry knight, chivalric knight. And uh, yeah, I enjoyed that more than I expected. I expected Ivanhoe to be a slog to get through because I had tried to read that as like a 13-year-old boy and it had gone over my head and I was expecting it to be the slog, this experience that I'd had at 13. It was quite different as an adult and I did enjoy it. Then I decided to read a little nautical fiction. So this is Master and Commander by Patrick O'Brien uh, is really nautical history, but also could be considered historical fiction since it sort of uh, mimics historical events. Uh, so yeah, first nautical fiction that I'd ever read. Of course, I've seen this at movie adaptation, which I really liked. And so I did enjoy this adventure in the sea as well. A lot of naval terms I had to learn. So I was really having to look a lot of stuff up there, uh, even though the author really does try to, and does a pretty good job of explaining this world of like 1800 uh, British Navy uh, era. Then I read Lavinia by Ursula K. Le Guin. This is another retelling of an ancient story, this time the Aeneid, and this time it does have Virgil in it, uh, who was the author of the Aeneid, and, and so it's, I do class this as a, as a historical fiction. This I really loved. You know, it was really immersive into this pre-Roman uh, society before Rome actually existed, and yeah, I, I, had, a, I had a great time with that. Then I read Harlem Shuffle by Colson Whitehead. This had been on my reading list for a couple of years because it's sort of a contemporary uh, look at Harlem in the like late 50s, early 60s, I believe, if I remember right. And, um, you know, it's a crime caper that, that ends up going on there. And uh, it was really entertaining. 
So yeah, five books in historical fiction, and then I had five books in science fiction as well. So my next most read genre was Mystery Detective, and I only read three books in Mystery Detective. I would have thought I would have read more. I think I read more in this genre last year, but nevertheless, I did get three in this year. Death Comes to Pemberley by P.D. James is uh, sort of the Jane Austen world of Pride and Prejudice, but there's later on after the events of the Jane Austen novel, when the family's all settled, uh, then there is a murder at Pemberley at uh, Mr. Darcy's estate. Um, then I read The Lady in the Lake by Raymond Chandler. So I love this mid-century detective, hardball detective fiction, and I did manage to get one read this year, The Lady in the Lake by Raymond Chandler. Then I read Cornell Woolrich's Fright. So I'd had this on my list to read for a long time, and boy, was this great. This was a psychological thriller. It's published in 1950, so it's set in that era, but a fantastic psychological thriller about a man who... Yeah, I don't want to give anything away. Um, it's just a, a lot of fun if you're into psychological thrillers from this era. This one was a good one. All right, so three mystery detective works. Finally, I read three works in history. So I read Film Noir Reader, which is a sort of a survey of film noir, how it began, uh, different essays about film noir, what it is, how it began, what is included in it, what is not. So it was really interesting. Then I, ch then I uh, read this book on the Scythians. I have been interested in the Scythians for a long time. Warrior Nomads of the Steppe by Barry Cunliffe. I had read another book by Barry Cunliffe that was also around the cultures of the steppe of Asia. And this, this one, this warrior culture of the Scythians, I just found it fascinating. And wow, they, are really, they were really fascinating. Yet to us in the modern world, fairly brutal, uh, but then in the ancient world, so much is compared to how we live today. Uh, but yeah, the Scythians, Warrior Nomads of the Steppe, really a, an enjoyable historical read for me. And then I read A Distant Mirror, The Calamitous 14th Century by Barbara W. Tuckman. So the, this, A Distant mirror, mirror is all about the 1300s. This one century, she takes a sort of a microcosm look in it. This is the, this is the century of the plague, the Black Death. This is the century of when chivalry was starting to, you know, it, we were moving out of the Middle Ages and about to begin the Renaissance. And so there was this, this transition period. So, yeah, I enjoyed that a lot. Barbara Tuckman is a fantastic historian to popularize history, and I enjoyed it a lot. Okay, so another way I mentioned that I like to take a look at the books that I've read is actually by publication year. Again, this year, I'm, you can definitely tell that I'm a backlist reader as opposed to a frontlist reader. You know, backlist readers and frontlist readers are equally important, I think, to publishing. The frontlist readers are those who support those new authors and support those new works, getting those new works out there. But the backlist readers are those who support, you know, the keeping things in print, keeping the older titles in print and keeping them out there and circulating. So we all have a role to play. I think this year I've definitely been a backlist reader supporter, uh, but nevertheless, I do appreciate those frontlist readers as well. So you can tell here from the 21st century, I read 15 books out of the 45, and I only read, you can see down at the bottom there, uh, one book that was published in 2023, The Game of All Games by J.P. Pereira. And, um, but I did read, uh, looks like I read works from every decade of the 21st century. Of course, we're only working on our third decade now. So um, yeah, uh, we uh, have a long ways to go in this century yet. But nevertheless, I read 15 books from the 21st century. So the youngest book I read was The Game of All Games by J.P. Pereira, this book of essays published in 2023. And then you can see the 20th century was the century that I read the most in. That's 24 books. Of course, this century I have all 10 decades there to work with in the 20th century. So um, I read a book from every decade of the 20th century with the exception of the 19 teens. So it looks like I'm missing the 19 teens there uh, for some reason, but every other decade was represented uh, through the 20th century. And again, I don't plan that. That's just how that has worked out uh, for my reading for 2023. 
And then for pre-20th century books, I read six. So the oldest book I read is actually The Divine Comedy by Dante, originally written in 1320. That's the oldest book. The newest book would have been The Game of All Games, The Book of Essays by J.P. Pereira. So most read authors, uh, Robert Jordan, the author of the Wheel of Time series, no surprise, I guess, that he is the most read author. Four books. I read two books by Isaac Asimov, two books by Ian M. Banks, those culture novels, and then two books by C.S. Lewis. And everybody else, all the other authors, just got one read. All right, I will leave this chat there. I hope I didn't ramble on too long. This may not be interesting to other people, but it's always really interesting to me, and I enjoy talking about it. Anyway, I hope you also had a great reading year, and I hope you have lots of good reading planned for 2024. I know that I do. As a matter of fact, these are some of the books I do have prioritized to read in 2024, and I will have a separate video coming up on my reading plans for 2024, so stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, I hope everybody had a great reading year, and I wish everybody a very happy new year. Until next time, take care.